welcome to this one hour webinar with Gibson Biddle and uh, it's Netflix 2022 product strategy and uh, before we think uh, kick things off I'd like to just uh, quickly introduce myself so my name is Marcus Kastenforce I come from a consultancy called Crisp and we're based in Stockholm Sweden we focus on agile product development and today I have the absolute privilege to uh, of introducing tonight's speaker Gibson Biddle how many times have we done this uh, Gibson quite a few times and it's always a pleasure to, to host these webinars with you. And Gibson is a, a seasoned product executive from, from Netflix, from Chegg, a textbook uh, rental service. Uh, so he was VP of product at Netflix and CPO, chief product officer at Chegg. And nowadays Gibson uh, does training workshops around the world. And uh, we're gonna enjoy a great presentation from Gibson. So a warm welcome to Gibson, the floor is yours. Hey, thanks Marcus. Um, okay. So I want to talk about Netflix's 2022 product strategy. I've used this as a way to introduce people to how I think about product strategy. I try to demystify it, uh, try to, to make it so that my goal in joining a new company is to outline a product strategy within my first two weeks. Um, I call that a swag. Uh, and I, if, if you know a little bit about me, I, I focus on helping product leaders all over the world make smart decisions about people, product, and the business. We'll be talking about forming a strategy, which is really a plan, but I'm always helping organizations to get these sort of three forces aligned. But the next part is, I call it consumer science, sort of better living through A-B testing, but it's all about experiments. So we will debate some cases today, uh, but you really don't know until you try stuff. And then the third force, um, I, I am fascinated by helping companies to define their culture as well because it really helps form a, an operating system, if you will, for people to work together and to help form judgment. So you'll be vaguely aware of these three forces today when I talk. My background, my first uh, successful startup was called Creative Wonders. I made kids software. I made Sesame Street software. This is Elmo. So this is my big hit circa, boy, 1997 or so, and helped uh, build a, a startup called Creative Wonders. I did Sesame Street, Schoolhouse Rock, Madeline, the little French girl. And then I sold, uh, we sold this company to the, at the time, the biggest educational software company in the world. Uh, it's called The Learning Company. We made Rita Rabbit software and Oregon Trail. Now you know how old I am because I actually worked on Oregon Trail, but I ran product for the, all of The Learning Company. And then we sold that company to Mattel for this huge amount of money at the time. It was like three billion bucks, and and it became a celebrated disaster. So this was uh, one of my big learning moments. Um, this was a quote from uh, a Brit. Uh, and but what had happened is a year after Mattel bought us, they had to devalue the company. Um, so where they had spent about, if I recall, it was four billion. They had to write off 3.6 billion. And that was a sort of big moment of learning for me because I had failed to build hard to copy advantage. It turned out all these other competitors entered the scene and were able to do work largely like we did. And this was the reason um, that, that the company lost so much value. Um, Kevin O'Leary, uh, he, he was the CEO of the learning company. He, he, he got his money. If you, some of you might know about Shark Tank, but he's Mr. Wonderful. So this thing brings me to, uh, I, I interviewed at Netflix in 2005, and this is Reed Hastings. He's the CEO of the company. And at the time, Netflix in the US was a DVD by mail company. These red envelopes would go back and forth. That's how it began. And uh, he asked me two interview questions. The first was, hey, Gib, can you delete, delight customers? And I said, well, I built Sesame Street Elmo's preschool, and luckily his kids had used it, and they were delighted. And then the second question he asked me is, hey, can you do consumer science? And luckily, I knew what he meant, um, you know, because when I had asked him what the legacy he wanted to create, it wasn't about creating a worldwide streaming company, original content. It was about this concept of consumer science, that we could create tools and systems to answer any question we wanted about real consumer behavior, consumer insight. And consumer science was this way to quickly experiment with different ideas. And I, I lightly lied and said yes, um, but obviously I got the job. So by background, I'm just, the, the key thing I'm highlighting here 
is that uh, I started Netflix in 2005 and then went on to Chegg, which is a textbook rental and homework help company that I helped to take public. And then I stopped working for direct deposit about seven years ago, and I really loved it. Anyways, I, I, I just, I'm highlighting, I'm no longer Netflix. I don't have any inside knowledge, but I like to talk about Netflix because everybody knows the product. So it's a great way to introduce these different ways to think and talk about product strategy and, and have interesting cases about what the heck should Netflix do um, post this stock crash they experienced halfway through the year. So my talk today, uh, just three chapters, if you will. I'm going to lightly introduce three frameworks to you. And then I'm going to go a little deeper on one of them. Uh, to know me, you know, I, I, I use about seven or eight frameworks. I don't have time for all of them. But then I'm going to pretend that I'm back at Netflix and I'm the head of product for Netflix today. And I will reflect on um, the challenges they faced and, and how they might modify their thinking, what they prioritize. And then we're going to do two juicy, what would you do Netflix cases? One of them would will be uh, the case that, that I already know that 60% of you are leaning against, which is, should Netflix do an ad supported plan? And the other one is, should they do a mobile only plan around the world? Folks are enjoying that in India, Malaysia, and Africa, but should they bring it to everybody? Okay, um, I'm assuming, Marcus, everything's working cool. My mic is good, et cetera. Oh, good. Yes. Fantastic. I'm in my wife's office today, and here I'm, I'm advertising for LinkedIn today. Um, so these three frameworks, also for Spindrift, right? They, they pay me tons of money. That's a joke. All right, so the way I think about strategy is it's a route to continuing power in a significant market. So the significant market, the job for a startup is to get big. That's the significant market. The continuing power is this notion of continuing. How, how do you build hard to copy advantage? And the root is sort of the plan. Um, but imagine you're explorer in 400 BC. You're trying to figure out how to get um, silk and jewels from, from today, what we'll call China to a significant uh, merchandise center, in London, how the heck do you do it? Do you do it by land or by sea? And that's a, that was an exploration, but uh, the answer was the Silk Road. And that, I'm sharing a photo of the Silk Road here. Uh, you can actually see the Great Wall of China. It's protected by that. It, it has existed for um, millennia. Um, so it has had a hard to copy advantage and it's created great commerce. Uh, and so that's why I, how I sort of think about strategy and why do I focus on strategy? Um, the main reason is it helps a product leader to do the hardest job uh, that they need to do, which is communicate an inspired vision of the future. And then I love how it lightly provides discipline to the chaos of creativity and in, in, in building innovative products or, or doing creative work, you can't over-discipline. And in most companies, the mistake that they make is they they put in lots of process and that squeezes the life out of innovation. So I love how strategy provides this light discipline um, to get things that are meaningful, uh, helpful for consumers and shareholders. The way I think about product strategy is it helps form hypotheses for how you'll delight customers in these hard to copy margin enhancing ways where margin enhancing just means build a better business or create profit that you can reinvest to building even better profit product in the future. And then as product leaders, we can do anything. We just can't do everything. So product strategy helps facilitate prioritization. What's the most important thing? The second most, third most. If you have a hundred things to do, it helps you to get focused on maybe five things that really matter. And then it helps communicate a plan. So my, I always join startups with a proof of concept that are ready to scale. And at some point, everybody gets confused. How does all this stuff fit together? And product strategy helps communicate that plan. So the three frameworks I'm going to very lightly introduce, the first I call the Glee framework, the second is the GEM, and then the third I'll go deep on is the, the DHM model. Glee, I'll share a product vision for Netflix. What, what's the first step, the first step you get big on? And then what's the second chapter of a company that you lead? And then what are the waves of substantial expansion beyond that. So with Netflix, they're essentially experimenting with their fifth wave right now. The GEM framework asked the question, how do you prioritize these three forces, growth, 
engagement. Engagement is just a proxy for product quality. How good is your product? And then monetization. How do you create margin profit to invest to build an even better product? And then I'll go deep on this delight and hard to copy margin enhancing ways. So uh, on the purpose for each, Glee is to help provide a long-term product vision. And Jim, it's if you have an organization where marketing and product, for instance, have a radically different ideas about how to prioritize growth versus build a better product, a more engaging product versus monetization, this is the biggest single source of lack of alignment organizations. And that's where the GEM model is helpful. And then DHM is really the way I think about product strategy. It's hypotheses to compete in the long term. So DHM is the way I define the product leader's job. Your job is to, in margin enhancing ways. And if there's one thing I hope you remember is that DHM stands for this. So I just want you thinking a little bit about your Netflix experience, but I'm guessing if, if I were to nicely ask you, how does Netflix delight you? The things that are on this list are probably the things. It took us years of experimentation to discover that these were the ideas um, that would delight in these hard to copy margin enhancing ways. And then Netflix has experimented. It'll surprise you how much we experimented with the business model. Uh, it used to actually be an a la carte business. You would rent one DVD, it show up in your mailbox, uh, and that would cost five or eight bucks. It actually took like five days. It was crazy bad. I mean, all startups suck at the beginning. And then we bet the company on this all you can eat subscription, uh, and it worked. Thank goodness. And then you're probably aware that Netflix does lots of price and plan tests. Um, and that generally over the last bunch of years, the price has gone up a little bit, mainly so that they can get more margin to invest in more original content. The stuff that you probably aren't aware of is, for instance, personalization. Uh, and there's, a, there's been an ongoing focus in creating a more personalized experience uh, for customers. It actually provides huge uh, business advantage. So for instance, when Netflix was looking at how much to invest in Stranger Things, they had all the data from, I mean, at, at the time, like 100 million people that um, it supported the idea that they could invest 500 million bucks in the series um, because they were highly confident based on all the data that they have about our viewing habits that many people would watch and enjoy it. Um, and, and so there was the 500 million investment. And then the, the, the data showed that maybe um, 20 million people would enjoy watching um, this silly series, which I enjoy, um, BoJack Horseman. And, um, uh, it, but the, it, and so based on that, they, they spent 100 million. I call this right-sizing their original content investment. Netflix is, is taking stories from all over the world, the people all over the world, and they want to bring all those stories to life. The key thing is they have to invest the right amount of dollars. And this is pretty consistent with that, that um, question I asked before we started. So here's the simple question of, um, that I'll ask all of you right now. What makes Netflix hard to copy? If I gave you 500 million bucks to start a startup today to compete with Netflix, what would make What's the hard to copy advantage that Netflix has today? Can you do the little pitch on um, your slide on one last time? Marcus? Yeah, I, I dropped a, a link in the chat. I think that works uh, to go directly to Slido, but you can use the QR code on the screen or go to slido.com and enter ask Gib in the browser. Hey, Anita, are you there? Let me pull her up. Uh, Anita, a simple question is, yeah, uh, sure. yeah, yeah. So what do you see? What do you see? Uh, how would you summarize what you're seeing on the screen right now? Mm. Original content seems to be taking this one. great taking the experience. Lead. Yeah. Right. Right. A lot of content personalization. I, I, I'm, I, I appreciate that people understand the hard to copy advantage. What else do you see, Anita? 
unique technology. Yeah, so what are some examples of the unique technology that Netflix has? To be honest, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, so for instance, personalization of those algorithms is amazing. Um, there's a, they have a lot of secret sauce. How do you deliver tons of streamed data really quickly? Like they, they launched Squid Games worldwide at one moment in time and nobody had problems, no hiccups, no nothing. So it gives you a sense. I always, I'm also gonna get a kick out of the folks that notice the power of a brand, brand recognition. So this is, you know, just, I'm trying to give you an example of how to think about this notion of hard to copy advantage. Thanks for playing Anita. Just, Anita's from Calgary. We, we were chatting before the talk, so I just cold called her. Um, so yeah, no the, I, yeah, yeah, I saw the, um, the list of stuff. And so my focus here, usually there's four buckets. So there's the brand, there's lots of examples of unique technology, but I, I focus on personalization here. Um, there's a network effect. Think about the advantage that Facebook has. It's a huge network effect. But in the early days, uh, we worked hard to make it so that every screen in the entire world where you could watch a movie or TV show was magically pre-wired. They were all Netflix ready devices. We sort of created this device ecosystem economies of scale, that, that, that this is the fancy way of describing the hard to copy advantage of original content. Because Netflix has 222 million members today, they can afford to spend $17 billion on their content. Um, whereas a punk startup couldn't do near that amount. Uh, and then the brand for us, it was all about creating this idea of movie enjoyment made easy. That's what uh, Neve Savage wanted to tattoo to my forehead so I would never forget it, or my forearm, which I obviously did not do. Um, but that's the value of, of a brand. It provides direction, but also helps create hard to copy advantage. So here are all of the experiments, if you will. Um, the, these were the ideas that we nicely thought had the potential to delight, but, but also built hard to copy advantage and also would help us to build a business. Um, so just note that I, I put a green against only five of them. Those were the things that worked. Um, the yellows were all in the sort of middle ground. Uh, you know, they actually helped build a better business, um, but weren't really building out hard to copy advantage. And then the reds are all failed experiments. And it surprises folks that unlike uh, Spotify, we, we experimented for like three or four years with social strategies to get movie ideas from your friends. But it turns out there's two problems with your friends. They have sucky movie taste. And second, nobody wants to let the world know that they were, they were binge watching uh, Cake Boss, you know, last night. Um, so those are all failed hypotheses in red. And, and I'm just sharing some of the current pretty big experiments and interactive stories at the bottom of games of uh, new technology for new ways of storytelling through both AR and VR. And those are just open questions. Netflix doesn't know, but they're experimenting with these different ideas today. Uh, and the, the mega issue here is just how long it takes um, to delight and hard to copy margin enhancing ways. It's been over 20 years. But I just did a very light introduction I wrote a um, series on Medium, how to define your product strategy. Um, you know, Marcus, I might have forgot to put it on the summary page at the end, but you can link bomb at some point. Uh, but I, 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 my intent here was to demystify product strategy, make it easy to do the work in a step-by-step -step way. Um, in my case, I, I would do a swag, a stupid wild ass guess of a product strategy. Usually in the first two weeks of work, I just wanted to have a conversation starter for where I thought each of these companies should go. So that's there, it's free. Um, okay, so now chapter two, I wanna talk about if I were back at Netflix today and I'm addressing today's like 10,000 employees for perspective when I left, it was like two or 3,000. Um, so how, if I were back, I'll just, I'll play. I'll pretend that you're the audience and Netflix. Hey, I'm excited to be back. It's today. It's September 7th, 2022. Just want to nicely remind you of the product we set out to build, the positioning. Netflix is a movie subscription service that delivers fast, 
easy entertainment in a friendly, straightforward way. And I think we've done a pr pretty good job. Uh, and then we were really summarizing this in this four words. It's all about movie, enjoyment, made easy, embracing simplicity and all the work that we do. Doing stuff that just works. It's not complex. And then the product vision at the beginning, we said step one, this is sort of how we as a startup establish a beachhead, if you will. Think of us as landing at Normandy. The first step was to get big on DVD and we did that. And then in January of 2007, we began the second step, which was to lead streaming. And because at some point we, we, we were leading this new wave, this new chapter, um, it was all digital. At some point, and this happened in 2010, we could expand worldwide. The problem with DVD by mail is it requires integration with local post offices. Some of you that might know the history, we actually almost launched in the UK. That was like circa 2005 with a DVD by mail service and then thought better of us. We were one week from launch and then changed our minds. Uh, and then the fourth big step is original content. That's obvious today. Um, but for instance, we experimented with original content during the DVD era and it, and it did not work. It failed. But by 2012 with House of Cards, we had a big enough service, enough economy of scale to invest a hundred million and, you know, sort of invent the concept of binge watching. And then uh, today, the current step, and think of Netflix as investing like two or 3% of its total resources. As a product leader, you always want to be able to describe what's next in this sort of step-by-step -step approach. So we got big on DVD, we led streaming, we expanded worldwide, we expanded, this is the glee part, into original content. And then the, the, the hypothesis is that we will expand into games. So if you're a careful watcher, if you've got kids, you might have noticed experiments with interactive storytelling. Uh, this, this is, uh, you know, you, uh, your child can drive the story here or my favorite Captain Underpants Epic choice Arama, where you make the choice, it's a slightly interactive or many of the grownups in the chat. Let me know if you've watched Bandersnatch and on a five-star system, what number you would give it. Um, but this was a big experiment for us. And then you can see uh, the focus on Netflix mobile. Okay, thank you, Francois, um, for saying it didn't suck. Um, and you can see the focus here on mobile Netflix games. So for instance, and also this concept of fast laughs. These are little early experiments, essentially with games and entertainment, or I think this is Polish. So this is what Stranger Things looks like in Polish, someone in the audience can verify the language for me, but I'm guessing I got it right. And then eventually some of this content uh, for these games from Netflix will come to the PlayStation. Um, I laugh, I don't know this, this very well, but there's a, a card game called Exploding Kit Kittens. It's big in different corners of the world, but the idea is late this year to bring interactive uh, games, movie content, and uh, you know, stuff on PlayStation around this big new brand for Netflix. All right. I want to acknowledge what the hell happened recently. So um, I'm sure uh, if, if, you, if you were hiding on a rock, you might not have noticed this. But um, our stock in at, when we announced the Q1 results, uh, our stock went from, we were valued as like 300 billion, it dropped all the way. So we were valued uh, at about a hundred billion. So that was a huge drop. Just by the way, if you look carefully, Netflix's stock is bumpy. So if you're trying to build a great and worldwide product and brand, um, you're, you're gonna have big learnings. <laughs> uh, and, and recently we had some very big learnings. Again, I'm not at Netflix, but I'm, I'm, I'm playing the role for you. So this is what I would do as a leader. You, you put the big fricking issues on the table. You don't hide them. So I just want to remind everybody in the building what happened. In Q1, we lost 200,000 subs. It was the first time in ever that we had uh, contracted, not grown. And then we had to say, you know what? Based on this, we think we're going to lose 2 million more subscribers in Q2, um, which, by the way, that's what happened. 
Um, but I want to explain what the heck did happen. So many of you wouldn't remember it, but when COVID fell, you know, Q1 of 2020, we had this quarter where 8 million subs joined that we hadn't expected. So we were plus 8 million against for forecast. And I call this pulling fo people forward. They were all fence sitters, but when movie theaters shut down, for instance, they were kind of thinking about Netflix and they suddenly joined. And the real big question was as COVID fades, what would happen? When would, would these fence sitters stay forever? Would growth slow, et cetera? And, and COVID made forecasting super foggy. And now with perfect hindsight, here's the trends that it was hiding. Turns out most of our growth is about getting to the big screen, to the TV. And that's all about households with both broadband and smart TVs in the house. And I know most or almost all of us online today, we're freaks, right? We've got broadband. We've probably got smart TVs in the house. We're probably using different services. But that's not true of everyone in the world. And then there's this other phenomenon that was hidden, which is called account sharing. So we have about 220 million folks that are paying and about 100 million that probably should be paying. So for instance, both of my daughters, are uh, they live in Brooklyn, New York, and Boston, Mass. I live in San Francisco. They probably shouldn't be sharing my account, but they are. And then, of course, there were lots of new streaming services. The Disney Plus launch, Disney got to... Uh, 200 million subscribers in 18 months, where it took Netflix 18 years. So big competition. And then macro factors, the war in Ukraine, it led to actually shutting down about 800,000 subscribers in Russia. Uh, you know, COVID is going back and forth. Will the theaters open? Not. And then inflation just made stuff more expensive for folks. I alluded to the competition. And, but this is the growth of streaming. It went from 26% uh, of folks streaming um, their content to 28.6%. That's reasonable growth um, over a year. But you can see the substantial growth from one point per percentage to 1.7%, the blue of Disney. Uh, and actually, you can see that Netflix has continued to grow too, from 6% to 6.4%. But that's what the competition looks like. So I just want to allude to some of the things that we're thinking about harder given these changes. So I nicely remind you that the product team's high level engagement metric that helps measure how good our product is, is monthly retention. And then it started as startup about 10% quit every month. Today, it's at a remarkable 2%, only 2% cancel each month. And in some cases, just that share more. Certainly, if you were in the Ukraine, we got more in, in, a larger increase, um, but this is our our this is how we measure the product quality of our product, and it's we continue to hope that a, a year from now only one percent will cancel, and our high level engagement metric to measure product quality is retention. So given this these macro issues, uh, you know, I just started a couple of months ago. But one of the first things I did was have a arm wrestling match with my marketing partner, my tech partner, my content partner, and really said, "Okay, how do we prioritize these three forces?" And the the thinking was to put growth first, to continue to put growth first. That the way that we've actually disappointed our investors, and that's building shareholder value, is we went from a growth company to losing subscribers for the first time. So the aspiration going forward is to continue to grow member growth at 10%. And monetization for the really clever observer, it used to be all about lifetime value, but we've slightly changed the metric here to average revenue per member. And it's about $15, but looking forward, how do we move that from 15 to 16 to 17, 18 to 19 to 20? What are the ways that we can influence the, the average amount that a member spends with us? And then engagement, it's always been uh, monthly retention, only 2% cancel. It doesn't mean that we don't care about it putting it third, but in looking at the macro projects against the company, we put growth first, monetization second, and engagement third. Uh, so this is the GEM model in action to help align everyone in the building. And then 
in any given year, the product team is able to focus on three, four, five, six high level product strategies that we hope will delight in hard to copy margin enhancing ways. So at, at the, currently, uh, we've been maniacally focused on personalization. And we, we have a metric, I call this the SMT model of RMSE. It's uh, we predicted that Marcus would like Stranger Things four stars. He gave it four stars. We were perfect in our prediction. This is one of those metrics where it's down and to the right is better to be perfect in predicting. Um, and then you can see in personalization, lots of other experiments, uh, a mood algorithm test to find out what mood you're in and what kind of film you're in the mood for on a Friday night. So you see in each of these, a high level product strategy on the left, a very specific proxy metric to measure if that high level theory, that product strategy is working. And third, example products, projects or tactics against each. And so the most substantial thing that I've changed in the last three months, this is me playing a role, is we've actually, and we, we did this at Startup as well, we were explicit in saying, we're gonna engage in a category of ideas focused on price plan and margin enhancement. It's so important to us to figure this out. So you can see me acknowledge some potential experiments like add to household, add a household. I mean, what for right now I'm paying 20 bucks a month and it'll say, hey, Gib, we noticed you have some users in Boston. Do you wanna add a household? This is Netflix's experiment in getting Kelsey who's in med school to pay. Um, so th these are the kinds of experiments that we're engaged in to bring up that average revenue per member. So at a high level, these are the product strategies. We continue to focus on growth, but th the main thing I've added as a response to the stock crash, if you will, is a lot of experiments that are explicitly tied that bringing, boosting that average revenue member. We're getting those 100 million people who probably should be paying to pay. This is what the roadmap looks like. So I spend my life presenting roadmaps to CEO, board members, investors. And I always say the same thing that I'm confident about the projects in Q3, you know, we're, we're gonna end it end of September. And then I'm also confident that Q4, Q1, Q2, this is the way to think about the category of ideas, but I'm gonna learn so much each quarter that this is not a commitment to exact dates or exact projects. And you can imagine the response to that, but, but this is to say in the world of consumer science, we have a plan, but then the experiments reveal something else. So I have been experimenting with a different approach. I call it an outcomes-based roadmap. Um, and I, I provided a link in this on the magic page at the end. These are exactly the same five strategies exactly the same proxy metric. I'm calling it a leading indicator now. And then instead of committing to a specific time frame, I say, these are the things that we're engaged in now, the highest priority, the highest out uh, possible outcome. Here's the next possible idea. And then here's something later. So a project-based roadmap takes away the Pacific quarters, which is actually quite a bit more consistent with um, how the world works, because we're not really committing to timelines. So with that, I'll say thank you. Uh, I've, I've been playing a role, um, but I wanna bring you into the building. So just think of, of our 110 peeps right now. You're all uh, product leaders in Netflix. And I wanna know what you think about two potential Netflix cases. Um, you'll be, have an opportunity to play via Slido, but also via chat. And occasionally Marcus is gonna pull someone like Anita into the conversation as well. Okay, uh, Marcus, is everything cool? Everything's great. Say it for me. And, oh, I love that Colette likes and knows exploding kittens. Why do you like it, um, Colette? And tell me more, cause I, I'm not very knowledgeable about it in chat. Okay, so I'm going to be doing some case studies. Um, case studies, you're allowed to ask some questions probably via chat, but I'm hoping you'll form an opinion. You'll let me know what you think via Slido. And then I'm hoping that we'll get some debate going because uh, that's really, you know, at Netflix, they call it farming for dissent. Some of the worst decisions they made are the ones that they failed to actually get great debate. Uh, the last big stock tumble was in 2011 with something called Quickster. You know, read 
the CEO says, hey, I just failed to let anybody stand up to me and say, the emperor has no, no, no clothes. All right, so the first case, should Netflix launch a worldwide mobile only plan? The only place you can watch on your tablets or your iPhone or your Android device. So just imagine this is what the price and plan looks like today, but it's not hard to imagine. Um, and this, is, this happens in India and in Malaysia, Thailand, Africa. Uh, imagine another plan choice on the left and it's only $4.99. Video quality is you know, lowest um, and you can only watch on your mobile device. So that's the question. Should, launch, should Netflix launch a mobile only plan to the entire world. And I want to give you a little context. Netflix as a company has been struggling in India. Um, there's a bunch of differences there. My, my guess is we've got some folks from India today. Um, so they have a smaller share up against those competition where rest of the world, they're the clear leader. Uh, and, and, and it's not because they haven't invested in original content. They have. And so they've been really trying to figure out what the hell, heck is going on there. The market is different. So in the U.S., many households are paying 100, 150 a month for cable TV for all that content. Uh, but cable TV in India is only about about three bucks a month. It's a real bargain. So if you think of the job switching people from cable to smart TVs, that's really hard because it's pretty cheap. Um, and then for a lot of folks in India, their internet at work is really good, but it sucks at home. And then for many, there are long commutes. And so this is, these are some of the reasons it's highly controversial that Netflix launched a mobile only plan in India. In fact, they did one other thing where they said they would not allow downloading because it was too complex. Um, they were forced to do it in India because people could download at work where they had good internet so they could watch at home where their internet sucked. Um, and uh, they also launched mobile only in Malaysia and in Africa. Africa is a country that it sort of skipped over PC-based internet, and the internet was mobile only. Uh, and I believe that's one of the reasons. And this is getting to the challenge for Netflix for the last five to 10 years, which is all countries are not the same. And they've been working to acknowledge that with huge original content spans like Lupin for Francois in France, um, but there's a lot of other changes as well. Africa is a continent, not a country. Thank you. I'm glad I, I got the chat. Uh, so in the continent of Africa, and I think most of the countries there, it's mobile only. Okay, so here's the provisional question I put to you. Without, I gave you a teeny bit of contents. Without more data, do you think Netflix should do this or not? And the next two questions, I'm going to use Slido to sort of farm for dissent. Ah, Anita, which way do you lean on this one? Uh, I would say yes, Netflix should launch mobile only plans. Yeah, what's your thinking? Uh, because there are lots of people around the world and mobile is something that is with them wherever they go. It's handy. People use different applications to watch different entertainment content using mobiles. So yeah. having Netflix in there also is good, I think. But of course, the technology and all should support, you know, having so many devices and streaming and the quality should still be retained. So that's another thing that I would look yeah. at. Yeah, but we've got a real horse race here, right, Anita? It looks like people are leaning forward um, into it. But it's, it, you know, it's like totally tied. Um, you want to fish for another volunteer to participate in the conversation, um, Marcus? Yeah, how about Colette? Let's see. Colette, we can talk now. So um, going from exploding kittens to this. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Um, well, coming from South Africa personally um, and really having a um, a bit more uh, experience with with some of the maybe problems that um, other countries don't really face, like um, internet connection issues, etc. 
I, I do, th I also lean towards um, the yes. Um, yeah. Long commutes are definitely something that ends up happening in other countries as well. Um, I live in the Netherlands at the moment and um, traveling by train, for instance, is, is a big thing. And people don't always want to work when they are doing that. So, yeah, I, I, I do think that um, there, there could be some value in that. Good. And this is one of those cases where, you know, I used the phrase earlier, as a product leader, we can do anything. We just can't do everything. And, you know, it just sort of strikes me that Netflix has chosen not to launch this worldwide. Um, but part of me is wondering or thinking with the shift, with the slowdown and growth, um, does that change the dynamics enough so that maybe they should lean forward and launch mobile only to more countries? Um, Colette, are you a uh, are you a Netflix member? I am indeed. Yeah. How much of your time do you spend watching stuff on mobile versus um, your laptop or your TV? What's a percentage guess? Mobile. Uh, laptop at the moment, nothing. So zero percent. Yeah. Um, on actual TV, I would say seventy percent, and mobile thirty. Yeah, very good. Okay, and Lucas is jumping ahead in the chat. He's saying, you know what? I I don't think this is margin enhancing because I'm guessing that there's you're going to cannibalize. It's good to have people on a ten, fifteen, and twenty. And opening up the $5 thing is just going to lower your average revenue, where what we're really trying to do is raise the average revenue, which is you know a great point. Okay, so I'm farming for descent. These are all great reasons to, to do this. And then uh, this is where, Lucas, you can put in you know the word cannibalization, which I think is a good summary of what you said. But this is me actively farming for descent. Um, so trying to understand you know, why do you think this is a good idea and why is this a potential bad idea? Uh, and it's it's a, uh, Netflix, part of the culture is all about candor, um, but they learn it even as, and of course, being candid, um, there's a lot of multicultural issues like being candid in Japan required lots of training uh, for the product leaders there. Okay, um, let's see, uh, Marcus, do you want to be the uh, narrator? What do you see? What do you see? Yeah, I mean, it's cannibalization that we, that we just talked about, lower uh, revenue, filling revenue. Um, By the way, um, uh, Marcus, B BHM in chat said, what would be your counter argument to cannibalization? So cannibalization is a good way to say we shouldn't do it. Well, you know, if you try to summarize the, the, the why people are leaning forward here, Marcus, what, what's the best argument against cannibalization? That it could be new users. So, right. so you're new bringing customers. all new users into right. the fray. And yep. the real problem that Netflix has today is that, you, that you're not growing fast enough. So this could be a substantial growth tactic um, and you know, provides more access to people that don't have it. You know, they don't have smart TVs. They don't have good internet, um, et cetera. Okay, so we've got, I, I, I love that we got a healthy balance. Russell said reach, you know, more people is good when you're trying to grow. Yeah, well, then there's going to be, you know, Lucas is pointing out, like, Netflix in a large part is all about big screen content, right? Uh, that's how it's grown up. Okay, so here's the discussion. Um, uh, my friend, Colette, how would you build the argument of why you should do this in a way, I think it will delight in hard to copy margin enhancing ways? How would you complete the sentence using that model? Because you, at the end, you were leaning forward, correct? Hmm. I was indeed leaning forward. Um, I think a few things, well, a few of the messages um, related to the, the $5 kind of price point. Um, but I do believe that that is debatable, maybe. As to yeah, the real question is what percent of users are going to choose that plan in Germany, right? If it's a two percent, are probably not worth doing. Mm. If if you discover it's a twenty percent, by the way, Netflix has the data in India, Malaysia, and in in the African continent. Um, we don't. 
Um, but my guess is the reason they haven't leaned forward is they don't think, you know, they think it's going to be a two percenter in Berlin. But keep going. That's how you measure delight. Is anything about this hard to copy if, if you do it well worldwide, Colette? I don't think so. Yeah, it's it's debatable. Like if I were trying yeah. to build the argument, I might say, you know, this codex for every freaking kind of mobile device and, and doing integration with the cell phone providers to get your data sitting on their servers so it's fast, easy. Those are potentially hard to copy, but I, I heard your hesitancy. It's a mm -hmm. little light. Okay. And then on the margin enhancing, what do you think? Good? Not? Again, we'd have to have figures around um, in which countries, what kind of growth we would expect. Totally. So Colette, you're, you're sort of doing a middle ground. What if we play this on a country by country basis, right? That's where you're going. It's mm -hmm. like, mm, that's interesting. Maybe that's the right way. But again, Netflix is looking for bold bets, big swings, worldwide mo mobile only. Okay. Uh, Colette, is this a high or a low stakes decision for you? If you're the head of product in Netflix, is this a big deal or a little deal? I think this is a big deal. Tell me why. Tell me why. Oh, because it would be very easy to roll out um, this very big initiative. Yes. Just to find that it doesn't actually work well enough and add enough value and delight customers everywhere. Yeah. By the way, uh, uh, Colette Duncan Leslie said building the he's got mobile only with his Disney Plus subscription on a Samsung device. So that's integration with these different partners, which these sort of exclusive relationships are hard to copy. OK, so uh, high or low stakes, you're saying it's big, huge in magnitude. Let me ask another question. If you got if you launch worldwide, could you roll this back? This is the Amazon argument of high stakes decisions are one way doors. Once you commit to it, it's kind of hard to wriggle out of it. Do you <laughs> think this is hard or easy to wriggle out if you got it wrong? I would say hard. I think you're right. I do You've think made, you're right. Yeah, especially if you, like you said, perhaps will have all of these agreements with these providers, um, definitely would be difficult. Totally. Okay. So I'm just asking the question again, because we've seen a little debate. You know, we, we, we've got the wisdom of crowds for yes, via Slido, the wisdom of crowds for no. We've seen some chat conversation. We've had some honor. And I just wanted to see if hearts and minds were going to be changed a little bit by this discussion. Now, recognize if we were at Netflix, we would be staring at, for instance, in Germany, what percent of current subscribers are watching on their mobile device? Like that would be great data, right? Um, if we saw it was 10 or 15% with current membership, that might be a signal that maybe there is, you know, a new audience we're not reach or reaching that, that, that wants the $5 mobile only. All right, Anita, we've changed some hearts and minds, haven't we? Looks like it. What, 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 why do you, or in chat, what was compelling? Was it the cannibalization from Lucas or what, what were the, what were the issues that caused people to lean back? I think going into the metrics, going into the data, thinking about the investment, thinking about the fact that we can't go back. Yeah, I'm with you. Okay. Well, this is a great conversation, great debate. What I've really tried to do is bring you into the room at Netflix, this, I'm sure this is being currently debated, right? Uh, I mean, there was the debate on download and playback later. Uh, we, we know what the outcome, all of us got download and playback later, but this is what it feels like. And I hope that these models, my, my guess is we're not gonna see Netflix launch this in the next six months. Um, so here's what I was hoping would come in this conversation. First, the value of farming for dissent, of really forcing people to, to, to say yay and nay. What's the, what's the metric? It, it's going to be the percentage measured by uh, by Plan Max. If we if we put out this plan and only two percent use it, probably not worth doing. If it's a ten percent, maybe it's worth doing. And then of course we we could look at all the data if we were at Netflix to help inform the decision. 
I think the, the, the need for Netflix to figure out new ways to grow is going to motivate experimentation. So I, my guess is we will see more mobile only experiments, you know, as Duncan pointed out around the world, country by country. And then this is the, the vexing issue of localization. All countries are not the same. For many, Netflix is about a big screen experience for many worldwide. And then, you know, Netflix by not doing it said, there's some bigger worldwide opportunities out there. Not that we won't ever do this, but we're probably not gonna do this in the next six to 12 months. That would be my guess. Okay, this is a more current issue. Should Netflix launch an ad supported plan? Same thing, right? five bucks with ads, right? Think of, of, a, of a column on the left that says, hey, do you want five bucks with ads? And by the way, just think of this as freaking big worldwide launch. So context, Netflix, I actually launched an advertising program in 2005. We put big ad banners on the site. We did ads on these red envelopes going back and forth. And then we killed it in 2008. So actually in 2007, we created 40 million in operating income, first profit ever. But then Reed sort of took me aside in 2008 and he said, hey, Gib, I need you to kill advertising. I'm like, whoa, it's really delivered on the business. He said, okay, Gib, who's gonna be the best in the world at advertising? I said, okay, Google. <laughs> and then what do we need to be the best in the world at? And, and he said, I, I, I said, personalization, okay? Uh, and he also felt that every time you give users more choice, it, a more complex experience, do I want this one or that one? That's not what we were about. We were about movie enjoyment made easy. It was really, it was all about simplicity that we were embracing. And we also had sort of a theory that there would be three lanes. This proved out. There were going to be some you pay as you go. In the early days, at Apple, you would pay one movie at a time. There would be ad base for folks in the US. Hulu was a great example. Uh, and then we were the all-you-can-eat subscription. So we said everybody's going to stick to their lanes. And that's largely been true. Of course, then we know that this happened, so badness. And then this is just the reminder slide. You know, the main thing is how do we get growth going again? Okay, that's the big question. So a little more context on ad-based model. In the U.S., there's Hulu. They're doing about $5 billion in revenue. And 70% of their customers aren't ad supported plans. Like, wow, that's a big wow. Now, all of us know Spotify. I'm just picking another one to give you context on monthly subscription versus ads. They've got 400 million monthly active users and 180 million, a little less than half are subs, which is to say the other half are generating ads. So 3 billion total revenue, but only 15% of the revenue is from advertising. So they've taken on a lot of complexity, but it hasn't quite been as healthy or as big as I'm sure they hoped. Um, I'm seeing Taylor saying Spotify with ads is incredibly annoying. Okay, so the question is, will this delight in hard to copy margin enhancing ways? Francois, you wanna take a shot at this one? Um, I'm with Chris on this. Uh, I think ads are incredibly annoying if you consider YouTube, for example. Um, I, I, I understand why people at some point would, uh, would consider giving up and subscribe for the premium option. Uh, in okay, this so specific case, I just, I just don't know whether it could really be um, something exciting for, for consumers. Got it. So you're saying I don't think we should do it because it doesn't provide delight. <laughs> and if you don't get a lot of consumers engaged in it, you're not going to build hard to copy um, um, advantage. And you're not going to build margin because it doesn't delight people. And that's the, in all of the work that we do, if, if we don't delight customers, then we're nowhere. You always have to delight. What would this do to the Netflix brand, Francois, if we did it? Uh, people would just first maybe compare like we just did with Spotify and who started with ads uh, and uh, compare with YouTube and stuff. So we would, we would definitely be in the wrong direction. That's my opinion. Yeah. Um, deep. where do you fall on this one? I think, it, <clears throat> I think it depends how we do the ads. Yes. 
So if we're going to do the ads like YouTube way, I agree with uh, the previous comment. You know, that's going to be really annoying. Yeah. But that's also not going to generate any additional revenue for Netflix because people are just going to go skip ads and they're used to that <clears throat> experience on the TV. So I, yeah. I think that's not going to help. But if we are doing ads, for example, at the end of Squid Games, you get to see uh, at once the C, uh, episode has end there you're like okay this is a merchandise that you can buy that yeah. might be a delightful experience especially with you know like let's like say baby shark you watch baby shark and then you can yeah. get those toys that shortens the funnel to buy it and that would lure more advertisers to netflix than to google because it's just a shortened funnel you just and that also provides another strategy where you get people's credit card and people could hold money just like what starbucks does and I think all the big tech companies go toward becoming a bank. So yep. you have Netflix credits and all that. So that would be a different discussion, a different strategy. So it depends how we do the ads. Totally. But remember, it took like YouTube like 25 years to, to you know, evolve some of their execution issues. And the issue, like when we launch, if we launch, it's going to suck at the beginning, but then we'll be committed to making it better and better, the execution. So I'm just going to, go quickly through this. This is like, you want to keep the search simple, service simple. That's why we killed ads, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, but on the other hand, you're giving customers choice. So I saw in the chat, this is providing more access via the lower price plan. That's providing choice to customer. They don't have to all choose advertising. This is high stakes. You know, it's similar to going mobile only around the world, high in magnitude. And second, probably hard to reverse course if it doesn't work. So um, I think we were sort of 60% against uh, early, Marcus, 40% for. I just want to see if this conversation has changed hearts and minds in any way. And the main thing to reflect on is Netflix has to answer the question, how are they going to continue to grow at a 10% year over year rate? With bonus points, if they can continue to create hard to copy advantage and move their average revenue from 15 bucks slowly up to 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. So they can invest more content, original content in the future. Okay, a slight change, Marcus, right? Based on this conversation. Cool. So I'm going to bring it home. Um, so Netflix is going to launch and they've done it in partnership. Uh, and I actually think they're going to launch before the end of the year. Uh, they've done it in partnership with Microsoft. And Reed Hastings, the CEO, in the earnings call, he said, hey, I, I've been a, against the complexity of advertising and a big fan of simplicity of subscription, but I'm an even bigger fan of consumer choice. Let's give people the choice to, to have ads with a $5 a month plan. Um, and, and so he's leaned very far forward into this. And here are the lessons. Um, in, in this case, he said, you know what? I think giving customers the choice, they don't all have to do this, is more important than keeping the service and the choice set simple. And he said, you know, we know it works. He can look at HBO. He can look at Hulu. Like there's plenty of data that this will work at scale. And he also said, let's outsource most of the work. Most of the work is finding the advertising partners, selling, et cetera. We'll let Microsoft do that. And we will stay focused on personalization. Uh, and then it, it, he's had to deal with this often. Like he, he's learned, he, he used to say, we'll never do advertising. And you know what I learned is never say never. All right, so I'm going to bring things home for you. Strategy is about developing this route to continuing power in a significant market. Here's this woman who's exploring this new journey uh, for her startup. Um, product strategies are these hypotheses on how you hope to delight in hard to copy margin enhancing way. And these frameworks enable you to, to lightly add discipline to the chaos of the creative innovative process without squeezing the life out of it as heavyweight process do. And it helps us to do the hardest thing, which is communicate an inspired vision of the future. I want to bring it home with a juicy quote. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up the people to gather wood, divide the work, and give orders. Teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. 
this is for you, Francois, from Le Petit Prince, um, Antoine de Saint-Zupery. I'm sure I butchered that. 